Wow, what a nice crowd this morning. My name is Connie Bolin. I'm the uh, founder and um, coordinator. Uh, actually, Kyle Guyatt does most of the work now, but I take the credit for it. So I'm the coordinator for Warbirds in Review, and uh, it is my pleasure to welcome all of you to day one of uh, Warbirds in Review here at EA Air Venture. On behalf of EA Warbirds of America and uh, myself and the entire crew, I thank you all for being here. I see a few familiar faces uh, who hear most uh, every presentation. We certainly have a nice group of uh, aircrafts and one gentleman here who's going to come on front stage here is fine. We're not very formal here, so that's, uh, that's fine. This year marks the 20th year that we have presented aircraft uh, through the generosity of the owners and the maintainers of the aircraft. So this year, once again, we have a great lineup for you. And uh, we cannot start this without saying thank you to those who make this possible. Uh, the volunteers and the aircraft owners, again, the maintainers, the, uh, all the people who make it possible, who always answer my call and say, sure, We'll bring the airplanes, sometimes going to extraordinary uh, efforts to make that happen. So today we start out, uh, again, the 20th uh, year that we have done this. Thanks to Scott's miracle Grow Company, who is our sustaining sponsor for, for Warbirds in Review. Jim Hagedorn, and Scott's miracle Grow Company, we could not do this without them. Ron and Diane Fagan, who presented us a very nice uh, building behind us here, they are the sponsors, and gave us the Quonset Hut, which is our production room, and a meeting room in the other uh, end of the building. Maybe someday it'll be a museum, but for now, uh, Today's first program, our moderator is going to be Sam Bass, my good friend Sam Bass, who has been with us for many, many years doing a great job. Sam flew in the Air Force and um, has, uh, again, he flew the EA B-17. He's done a lot of really great things, so he's one that knows a lot about aircraft and will be our moderator for the uh, program this morning. And uh, we have an introductory video that will introduce you to the gentleman who uh, will be our first speakers. So uh, if you could uh, direct your attention to the Jumbotron and we'll do the intro video and then Sam will take over. The Navy's first ace was Naval Aviator No. 85, David Ingalls, in 1918. Flying a British Sopwith Camel for the RAF, he shot down five German airplanes in six weeks. Plane design and production proceeded unstopped for the next 20 years, and by World War II, naval aviation had become a power to defend our way of life, particularly in the Pacific Theater, after the surprise Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor, December 7, 1941. Just four months later, in April 1942, Jimmy Doolittle led 16 Army Air Corps B-25 bombers from the Navy carrier Hornet in a daring raid. They accurately and successfully bombed targets in Japan that sent a strong message to the Japanese leadership. The message? you made a huge mistake bombing America. Navy planes dominated in the Pacific War. Fighters, the Grumman Cat series, the Wildcat, the Bearcat, the Tigercat, and the Hellcat. Hellcat pilots shot down over 5,000 Japanese airplanes in the Pacific. And the Helldiver that replaced the Dauntless. There were PBYs and the Kingfisher spotter and rescue planes and, of course, the 400-mile-per-hour Corsair. 
The Corsair was one of the most successful fighter planes of World War II and very effective later in the Korean War. Most of its fighting in World War II was in the Pacific theater against the Japanese. The Navy flew the Corsair from aircraft carriers, the Marines from island airfields. It was an air-to-air -air fighter, it was a ground attack aircraft, and escorted on bomber missions, protecting them from Japanese fighters. The Japanese called it whistling death because of a distinctive sound the Corsair made at high speeds. Today, we have a Corsair sponsored by Jumbo Lair Aviation Community and owned and operated by the American Honor Foundation. It is newly painted in honor of U.S. Naval aviator Charles Joseph O.B. O'Brien. Growing up building models, hanging out the airport, and devouring aviation books and magazines, O.B. took to the skies at nine years of age in a Ford Trimotor in 1937. Flying was in his blood. In 1946, while Obi graduated from prep school, the Navy started a new program for potential pilots, known as the Naval Aviation College Program. Passing all the necessary exams, he was eligible to attend a college with a Naval ROTC program. He enrolled in Villanova College and was also sworn into the Navy on July 18, 1946 as a V-5 apprentice seaman. After spending the required two years in college, Obi reported to Naval Air Station Pensacola, Florida, where he trained in the SNJ and Hellcat. He earned his gold wings in June of 1950. Upon graduation, he reported for duty with Jet Training Unit 1 at Whiting Field, where he logged time in the Lockheed T-01. The Navy's designation for the F-80C Shooting Star. Completing his jet training, Obi was assigned to a Corsair unit. As he says, go figure. Obi has over 7,000 flight hours in 52 types of aircraft and 735 arrested landings on 20 different carriers. He also held the honor of being the only pilot in the world actively flying the Corsair, like he flew in combat until he retired in 2013 at the young age of 85. 359 was my airplane. It had my name on it. Uh, and I, I liked it. Of course, uh, I, I flew it three times in combat. It's been well taken care of. It's, it's uh, had six or seven owners in the last 60 years and it's just like a brand new airplane. When I got in it, a lot of nostalgia, some of the instruments I didn't recognize because uh, when I flew it, it, had, it was pretty basic, but the airplane smelled just the same. Just, uh, I, I certainly uh, appreciate the, the past owner and the present owners taking care of my, my airplane. Good morning, folks. Welcome to Warbirds of America 2020-21. We missed last year. We're, at, we're going to have uh, our pilot presentators here, three of them, and I'm going to introduce you to them very shortly. We're going to have the video, a uh, fairly long video with Obi, and then we'll have talk about the particular airplanes, and then we, if we have time, we're going to have a question and answer. So to start off, we have Charlie Lynch. Charlie, would you raise your hand there? And Charlie, he works in private aviation. He's qualified in numerous aircraft, including the Zero, the P-51, the Spit, the Corsair, these airplanes here. Then we have Mark Murphy. Mark's in the center here. Mark is a professional warbird instructor in the TBM, the P-51, the B-25, the T-28, the L-39, the Corsair, the DC-3, the Jab Zero, the P-40s, the Hellcat, Spitfire, and other airplanes. 
He's got 7,500 hours of flying time, and he's you've been flying Warbird since when? Since about uh, 2005. So when you were five years old. Uh, exactly. <laughs> okay. 52 years old. Yeah. Now we have Zach McNeil on my left here. Now, Zach is a retired Navy, 20 years pilot for a major airline. He flies now for a major airline. He's an EA examiner inspector sp specializing in heavy helicopters and fighter training. He's a designated flight examiner, and he lists two, there's too many airplanes for even try, so we won't list them. Now, Zach, will you tell us a little bit about your foundation, and also at, at your end of it, would you go ahead and present our uh, O.B. O'Brien video, please? Yeah, thanks. Um, the present or the uh, foundation's name is American Honor Foundation. Uh, we started it uh, last year, um, and you can tell we're rapidly uh, uh, growing our collection. the The idea is to identify a type of warbird and a specific pilot that we like to honor. That's uh, does has done something that we think is neat uh, or cool as a group. Um, we started with a, a P fifty one. Uh, we got another P-51, we got the Corsair, we have the F-86, we have an L-39 and a T-6, and we're still working on building our, uh, our collection. Um, as you can see, we have, we'll talk a little bit later about the, the pilot, the F-86 named after, and we're going to concentrate on the uh, pilot uh, OB with the uh, Corsair today. Um, I want to mention, if you don't mind, the uh, sponsor that let us come up here. Please do. Um, Jumble Air. Uh, anybody, raise your hand if you ever heard of Jumble Air. <laughs> it's got a really eclectic past. Uh, it was recently purchased by our main sponsor for the foundation. Um, it's, it's been a zoo for elephants. Uh, it has a really unique, it's the uh, in, longest privately owned runway in the United States, and one of the biggest tenants there is uh, John Travolta. The uh, current owner is redeveloping it. It's going to build some aviation estates there, and part of the... Uh, uh, our marketing campaign is to bring all these beautiful aircraft here and let everybody know about it. So if you're thinking about buying a nice estate down in Florida, in the Kala area, <laughs> please come talk to us. We'd love to have you and help support the Warbird community. Um, and finally, um, I was had a few notes and facts to introduce Obi, but it was so brilliantly yeah. covered in the uh, <laughs> intro there. Uh, the one thing I do want to uh, mention uh, about Obi was he was on three different uh, ships, USS Coral Sea, USS Lake Champagne, and the USS Boxer. He had 70 hours combat time and 22 hours of uh, combat sorties. And uh, I want to point out the obvious. It's very rare to actually have a combat veteran warbird because of how um, the aircraft, people didn't want to buy the ones with bullet holes. They bought the ones that were just coming off the assembly line. So we have an actual um, aircraft here. Um, afterwards, I'll be standing. We have the actual... Uh, chart that OB used in the Korean War um, to uh, fight with this aircraft. Um, of course, it won't leave my hands, but if anybody would like to see it, I'll, I'll show it to you later today, and we'll have some pictures up on Warbirds in Review. So without a further ado, I'd like to introduce our interview with OB. So pay attention to the Jumbotron. Ever since I was a, a little toddler, toddler, about five years old, I was interested in airplanes. We were vacationing in Ocean City, New Jersey, Fortunately, there was an airport very close to us, and I, I would go down there on my bike and hang around and talk to the people. And I saw a sign that says there's going to be a tri-motor Ford airplane here next week, uh, and you can get a ride on one. If, so I thought that was a good idea. And the price for me would be $2.50. $2.50, I was only uh, nine years old. This is 1937. Two, $2.50, I was a paper boy and I got a penny of paper. So that was 250 papers I had to d deliver to get that ride. So I went down there and I got onto the airplane. We had about a 15 minute ride and I came back. I had not asked my parents whether it was okay or not because I figured that permission was to be very hard, impossible to get, and forgiveness might be a little bit easier. So I, I took my ride, 
And then when I came home, I told my mother what I had done, and she was very, very unhappy. And uh, I told her how sorry I was, but I got a good ride. My father just kind of smiled. Uh, I did. That was the last ride I had until I joined the Navy and started Navy flight training. But that s cemented my desire to fly. There is no doubt that what I was going to do later in life. I graduated from high school in 1946. In 1946, everybody in the Navy was, all the pilots, everybody was get, getting out and going back to school. The, the Navy saw that there would be a valley of uh, lack of pilots during those, those years, and so they started a one-year program, which would, uh, if you could qualify, get yourself into an NROTC college, pass all the aviation, the physical and the mental, pass the interviews. They would let you enlist as an apprentice seaman, send you to school for two years. I, I went to Villanova, by the way, uh, for, two, for, for two years, $50 a month on books and tuition. And then following that, you would go to Pensacola, be sworn in as a midshipman, and go th through flight training. I went to Pensacola in 1948, uh, took basic flight training in the SNJ, qualified on the carrier in the SNJ, went down to Corpus Christi for advanced training, flew the Hellcat, the S6F, went through that training, qualified on the carrier in the S6F and uh, got my wings in June of 1950. In, in 1950, I was assigned to take jet training. The Navy had some uh, F-80s, we called them TO-1s, single seat jet. And I, uh, it was only a month course, 25 hours, and I went through that uh, and enjoyed fl flying the jet. It was a new experience for me after flying the, the uh, SNJ and the S-6. My first flight, I had never been in a tricycle landing gear. I had never been in any kind of a jet, even a commercial jet. And so it was quite a thrill to s sit there, be able to see the runway clearly and uh, add the power and take off. It was uh, quite a thrill. After completing the, the jet training, I went to talk to my detailer and he said, "We're." Uh, the Korean War had started, and they were starting a couple of squadrons down in Jacksonville, Florida. It was four Corsair squadrons, and they needed pilots. So guess where I was going? I was going to uh, Jacksonville and fly Corsairs, which I had mixed feelings about. I, I would like to fly the Corsair, but I also would have liked to flown jets. But in the end, I think the best thing that ever happened to me, really, was to to, to be assigned to Corsairs. I made two uh, mid cruises in the Corsair, flying the F4U-5, the first cruise, the F4U-4, the second cruise, and then we went to Korea flying the F4U-4. The skipper called us uh, into an all-pilots meeting <laughs> and said, guess where we're going, guys? Because everybody really was anxious to do our share. The, the West Coast pilots were uh, flying and we were going in the mid, we, we thought maybe we should be doing our, our share of the fighting. So we, we left Mayport, Florida on the Lake Champlain, which is a Essex type carrier, straight deck of course, and w went through the mid, through the Suez and into Korea. We, we flew a line period from the Lake Champlain and uh, crossed decked over to the uh, USS Boxer, and they, they sent a uh, jet squadron over to the Lake Champlain. It had something to do with the fuel capacity of the ships. On my first launch, we, we briefed in the ready room for a strike on a bridge. The, the bomb load was going to be a 1,000-pound bomb and two, uh, 250 bombs and uh, six, six loaded uh, 50 caliber machine guns. 
we, we briefed very carefully the, uh, there was a, a launch of four, four Corsairs. I was number four. Uh, went out to the airplane. At that time, I remember being a 25-year-old bachelor, hot to trot, ready to go out and break something. Really. So, so you, you, I, when I got in the airplane, you would taxi up to the, uh, the de deck launch officer. He would give you the wind-up signal after you gave him a thumbs up that your instruments were okay. You would add as much power as you could until you felt the tail just getting very light. When he gave you the signal to go, you would add full power. And uh, that big 13-inch, 13 13-foot 13, uh, prop, a lot of torque. So you would, needed a lot of right rudder and went, went off the deck. Uh, the ship would be making some of its own wind, at least 30, 32, maybe 35 knots. You were too heavy to, for the, the natural wind in the ships. They would download you a little bit, but that didn't happen very often. In any case, when you went off the end of the deck, you would settle just a little bit. You would get your wheels up as fast as you could, get a little bit of speed, raise those flaps gently, and turn, turn off. The flight that we had was on a bridge in North Korea, uh, and it was heavily defended on both both ends. I, th I think it, there was a, also a, a, rail, a r railroad uh, tracks on it. We climbed up to 8,000 feet, saw the target, and we made individual runs. The, the, this, uh, the leader went down, number two, number three, and number four, which was me. By the time I got started in my run, there was a pr pretty heavy uh, anti-aircraft fire. And I thought, oh boy. And uh, uh, coming down, I, I could see these uh, orange, they looked like tennis balls coming up at me. And I thought, and I could hear them as they went by the airplane, go, woof, woof. And I, then I thought to myself, I'm seeing only about a sixth of the ammunition being released. But anyway, we, we would drop our bombs at about 3,000, uh, the, the big bomb, about 3,000 feet. And then we made two more passes to get rid of the other two bombs. And with each pass, it seemed like the, those uh, tennis balls, those red tennis balls, I call them, were getting closer and closer and more and more. In any case, when I got back to the ship, no, nobody was hit. It was a, a good, a good flight, and we did significant uh, damage to the uh, the bridge. We came back, came around. We all we all got aboard safely, and when I got out, then I got scared. I was I was not scared on the. I was concerned, but I wasn't scared until I got back in the ready room and said, "Oh boy, that was hairy." We flew uh, both, uh, I think, uh, of the uh, 24 missions, I flew uh, 11 close air support missions. The rest were strikes. And when we couldn't do a strike, we would be uh, set free to do what we called road recce. And anything in North Korea was moving, uh, wheeled, we would uh, shoot at. Okay. Uh, on one occasion, I got two box cars, which was good. Okay. Did you always fly number four, or did you move up to an element lead no, or flight lead? I, I was mostly number four. I, w I was only an ensign. And you and, were one of the young guys in the squadron. I was one of the young guys in the squadron. And we, fl we flew in sections, the, the leader and his wingman, and then the section leader, which were the, the last two airplanes. And that would be a... a a more senior officer than a, an ensign or a JG, but that that was my that was my spot which I liked, and I would try to uh, when we were making a run I would c kind of get off to the side a little bit or come in at a slightly different angle because I knew that they had more sighted those uh, those first three airplanes and I wanted to 
I wanted to uh, not be in the same flight path. The, the missions that I liked more than uh, the, the strikes were close air support. And the way that worked is after you would launch from the ship, they would sh sh uh, sh uh, shift you to a, a unit called Red Crown, which uh, coordinated all the, uh, the, the close air support missions. If somebody needed close air support, they would go to Red Crown and then they, they would assign you a mission. I liked those missions because we could get down low we knew that we were helping our troops. Uh, and th that was very rewarding. And it was especially rewarding when you got uh, a message from, from the ground that had a boy. And that, that was really good. We were controlled a lot of the times by an Air Force uh, Mosquito, SNJ, and he would mark a target for us. And he would tell us what, our, what the results of our, our uh, mission were. And I enjoyed that because I felt I was really doing something to help people. And when I got an attaboy, that made me feel great. They would mark the target sometimes. They, okay, I'm going to sh put out a, a red rocket. And that, that's the target. It, your target is so many feet from, from that. Okay, I see a, the, red, the red smoke, but then I look around and I see red smoke, red smoke, red smoke. Those ra rascals were listening to us. And, and they, it was clever. They uh, had those things said. I guess they could do it by remote control, but it, it would, if you didn't see, know where the original smoke was and you just came in, you wouldn't know what you, what you were supposed to do. Yeah, uh, I was flying, flying missions, and when the war was over, uh, <laughs> Instead of d b bombing, we, we would go out and fly our mission on the last day. Instead of going down, getting low and dr dropping the bomb, what, uh, we did what I called dip bombing. It would fly along, drop the nose a little bit, drop your bombs and get out of there. <laughs> Nobody wanted to be the last one shot down. That's Th 359 was my airplane. It had my name on it. Uh, and I, I liked it. Of course, uh, I, I flew it down in uh, Jacksonville, and I flew it uh, three times in combat. It was a good airplane. I liked it very much. And on the way home from Korea, we were, came back through the Med, and the Navy told us to drop off two of our Corsairs in Port Laoti. I volunteered. Since my, my airplane was going to be one of the put in the pool status, I volunteered to take it to Port Laoti, and I, I flew it over there and uh, with, with the other guy. And we, we parked the airplanes and we were brought immediately back to the ship as soon as we transferred the airplanes. That was the last time I saw that airplane until a couple of years ago, I found that airplane was still flying and it was in California. Okay, a after we got back to Jacksonville with BF-44. We traded in our Corsairs for Banshees, the McDonald uh, twin-engine jet. So I finally got to jets a little bit late, but I got to them. I flew them for the next 10 months when I got orders to Pensacola to be an instructor. I was an instructor in Pensacola uh, flying the SNJ, and from there I went to photos, a photo reconnaissance school and uh, came back to Jacksonville in the, uh, the Photo Crusader. The Photo Crusader was just, just like the fighter, except it didn't have any armament. It didn't have any guns. It was unarmed. Every carrier had three of those uh, Crusaders on it. We, we did the same thing that the satellites do now. Uh, I made three cruisers in, in the Crusader, and our, our squadron motto was alone, because we flew alone. We were unarmed, because we were unarmed, and we were un, unafraid. And I always figured two out of three is not too bad. After leaving the, uh, 
Crusaders, which was a fine airplane. It was the second best airplane I've ever flown. The Corsair was the best and the Crusader was second best. I got orders to New York recruit aviation uh, orientated officers. That would be the AOC, uh, the crewmen and, and the pilots. I did that for 15 months, went to the postgraduate school, finally got my degree, and then went to the USS Bonham Richard as the assistant air officer. The assistant air officer is, is uh, the air officer in charge of all aircraft movements within, the, within th about three miles of the ship and everything on the deck. I spent 15 months there and then uh, came back to Norfolk. And uh, here I was assigned to a staff, Commander Fleet Air Norfolk, which had uh, air stations and all the fleet airplanes aboard. I was operations officer there. And then uh, I got orders to uh, be 7th Fleet representative, 7th Fleet uh, liaison in Saigon to everybody in Saigon. It was a, like the go-to guy for carrier questions. I spent uh, 14 months there. I came back to Norfolk and finished out my tours as uh, operations officer of uh, Naval Air Station Norfolk. Meantime, I got attached. Uh, I found out there was a, a group in New York called the Sky Typers. They were flying SNJs, five SNJs, 10,000 feet. Center one had a, a fly line abreast. The center one had a computer in it which triggers smoke on all five airplanes, which led uh, a dot matrix message across the sky. And that was a lot of fun. I flew, flew with them for 24 years, 24 air show seasons. The, the fighter factory over in Suffolk had some nice airplanes. And they were going to build a museum is where we, we are. And they, they had the Corsair, they had a, a TBM, and they had a, a Sky Raider and a lot of other airplanes. They, Mosquito, and um, so I wrote a very nice letter and said, told the sky typers I would, uh, I found a better deal, so I was going to fly with them. <laughs> to, to get into flying the museum, I had plenty of, plenty of flight time, I had heavy, heavy time, and they were looking for a couple pilots, particularly SNJ pilot. So I, I started flying the, the fighter factory's SNJ. And uh, then they got the Corsair, and since I had a lot of Corsair time, I got checked out in the Corsair. And since I was checked out in the Corsair, I thought maybe I should check out in their TBM. And when I checked out in the TBM, I thought maybe I ought to check out in the AD. And I did, plus all the other airplanes. And then they uh, built the uh, Military Aviation Museum here in uh, Virginia Beach. And we moved from Suffolk, from the fighter factory, we moved everything over here. The surprise that you had for me was that my, 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 my Corsair 412-359 was flying in California, belonged to a, a gentleman out there. And my friend Steve uh, contacted him and he said, if, if he's qualified in the Corsair, he's, he's more than welcome to come fly his old mount. And over the course of two years, it was delayed. And finally, uh, we, we set a date, and we went out to California, to Ramona, near San Diego. And I was fortunate enough to fly my old Corsair so that I had left in Port Laoti 59 years ago. The last time I saw the airplane in Port Laoti it had been well worn. It was tired. It had been at, uh, at sea for eight months, combat in three, three or four months. Uh, and it, it was, it was needed a paint job. When I saw it in Ramona, they opened the hangar doors and I saw a beautiful plane just like it was off the uh, the, the line. It was shiny. It was painted up very nice. It had uh, 
Jesse Brown's name on one side, he was shot down in Korea. Uh, and on the other side was Hudner's name. Hud Tom Hudner was a pilot who landed next to Jesse Brown in an effort to, unsuccessful effort to save him. Hudner was uh, uh, la later on presented with the uh, Congressional Medal of Honor for that, for that action. Unfortunately, uh, Jesse Brown was not recovered. No, I, 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 I thought about the people who had flown that airplane, in, in addition to myself. They, they were, they're all, they were all retired or, or passed on. And all the, all the you know, fun we used to have in the squadron, and uh, it just brought back memories of nice times and nice people and times that, uh, that I relish. And I took a photo of you um, sitting in a, an easy chair with a bottle of cold water. And <laughs> I remember the airplane was parked right in front of the hangar and you were staring at it and it seemed like yeah, you were a million miles away. I was. <laughs> I was a million miles and 60 years away. I got a call from you, Steve, uh, about two months ago, maybe three, and you, you mentioned to me that my airplane was no longer in California, but it was in Florida. And uh, the, the owner, uh, the, the new owner, wanted to paint it in its, its original colors from VF-44 and with my number 412 on it. and. Uh, the squadron uh, designations, the, the F1, the tail, and the, the yellow wingtips and rudder, top top rudder, and uh, I th that's great. They, they're going to put your name on the on the uh, airplane, and I I was ecstatic. I understand that it's been. It was in the Bob Bob Black Sheep uh, series. It was. Uh, in the Reno air races, and it's just like a brand new airplane. When I got in it, a lot of nostalgia, some of the instruments I didn't recognize because uh, when I flew it, it, had, it was pretty basic, but the airplane smelled just the same. Just, uh, so uh, I, I certainly uh, appreciate the, the past owner and the present owners taking care of my, my airplane. We have our three pilot presenters here and uh, Mark is gonna be our expert today on the F4UF Corsair behind him. And uh, first of all, Mark, tell us how you got into the Warbirds and when you started. Okay. Um, so th th thank you all for coming. I really appreciate uh, you taking your time out of your busy schedule. Uh, this is about my 20th time at Oshkosh, so it's, uh, it's an honor to be here. And uh, I know it's hot, so if it makes you feel any better, uh, people ask us what it's like to fly one of these airplanes. Imagine putting on your winter coat on a day like today, get in your car, and instead of starting it and turning on the air conditioner, you turn the heat on. That's about what it feels like. <laughs> Uh, but anyway, uh, how I got started in this, uh, my father's here in the crowd. I grew up on a 4,000-foot grass strip, started out in the Piper Cub when I was 16, moved up to a Stearman and a T6, a P-51, and then uh, started working for a few museums and got the opportunity to fly uh, 11 different types of warbirds and then went on to become an instructor teaching other people to fly the P-51 and the Corsair. So that's where I got my start. Tell us a little bit about the specs on this, the Corsair, please. This, this, Charlie, go ahead. This one's, this one's his department. <laughs> that's a subtle handoff. <laughs> and we are greatly honored to be able to present this plane today. And, and thank you very much to John and Dan Mosley and their crew at John's 360 Coatings, who not only painted this magnificent airplane, but their products help us keep it clean with a little bit of elbow grease. 
there were over 12,000 of these airplanes built, and, and I think the great history of this is this wasn't just a World War II plane. This was designed in the early part of the war and wound up finishing through Korea. So of those, you had airplanes built by Chance Vaught in Connecticut. You had Brewster Aircraft and Goodyear who actually built the most of them. And the number in various uh, models, this is a Dash 4, which is a later model airplane. Um, the difference between the early bird cage one where uh, people like our great friend Jim Tobel has a chance to fly to this, it is night and day. It is, it's just the, the difference is incredible. So we're fortunate to do this. OB's presentation, for us to be able to fly a plane like this, and thanks to Steve Chappis, our good friend who introduced us to uh, OB, and, and to have the honor of flying a combat veteran with the history and still having the pilot uh, today alive, uh, Sam, is just a true pleasure. Because as you pointed out, most of the Corsairs, we, the one we fly the most was a racing airplane. Um, and, and so it, if you ask somebody the specs of a Corsair, it's sort of happy to tell you which model. <laughs> well, how big an how big engine is this airline? Well, and, and Sam, so that's one of those things that this was the real um, difference maker compared to like the Zero that, that Mark and I get to fly. This was a beast. This is a 2,000 horsepower engine built by Pratt & Whitney, 2,800. And again, being Northeast guys, we have a little bit of pride because the plane was designed in Connecticut and originally built in Connecticut, but so too was the engine built by Pratt & Whitney up in Hartford and Hartzell pr Propeller. So big, big engine. Now the propeller has a lot to do with the design of the wing, is that correct? Very much so. So they had such a big engine with so much horsepower, the only way you can convert that engine power to thrust was this giant 13 plus inch or foot uh, propeller. And to land it on a carrier, to have this clearance with this big prop, the landing gear would have to be massive. And of course, it becomes a weak point and a point of potential failure. So some very genius people with slide rules or forget computers and all that figured out, you know, if we just bend the wings, the gear can be shorter and stouter and take the punishment that you see with carrier landings. That's why we have the gull wing. And, and one of the things about the armament, um, not a lot of people have been able to fly a Corsair with all the rockets and the drop tanks on it. And so a little quick story, when I went to pick up this airplane, Charlie went with me, and it came with all the rockets, the drop tank, but they were all in a corner, and we were deciding, okay, how are we going to get these moved? And we were going to box them all up, but then we got thinking, okay, this is going to be a pretty big box, so let's just hang it all back on the airplane the way it's supposed to be, and we'll take it with us. Well, we had no idea how much drag and weight that adds to the airplane. So I couldn't imagine, we fly it clean today and light, I couldn't imagine taking off on an aircraft carrier with full drop tanks, full rockets, full of fuel, and full of ammunition. Uh, it, it really had to um, probably be a big struggle because it, it's such a dynamic difference. It probably slows the airplane down 30 knots with all that drag. Tell us, uh, the, the mission, for the, it could be the air to ground or escort, it, it could be a number of missions, but a, a typical mission on this airplane flying off the carrier. You know, it really depends, uh, you know, are you talking early in the war or later in the war? One of the things that, that we really enjoy, and, and it's such a privilege and honor, is to be able to fly both a Japanese Zero as well as the Corsair. And I'll tell you, at some of the air shows down in a confined environment, sort of slow speed, that Zero will eat the Corsair's lunch every single time. It is a kite with a great big engine. Well, I, I'm the pilot flying the, the well, Zero, okay, too, so, so when he's give me a little credit. It's the Zero is a better airplane. But with that said, as soon as we go somewhere, and we've heard pilots will sometimes play around as they're traveling places we never well, do. We, it, we don't do that, no. of course. But once you get above 200 knots, that stick in that Zero, it's like it's in concrete. Yeah. This plane will start an aerobatic routine at 310, 320 knots. You do that and pull back and you just finger pressure all day long on the stick. So whether it's slow speed coming into a short grass field or you know high speed aerobatics, it's a delight to, to fly. Well, speaking of the zero, what's the kill ratio between this airplane and the zero? Well, not necessarily the, the zero, but the number I know that overall it's about 11 to one. That's it what was, I heard of. It was yeah. designed as a zero killer. Actually, it killed more. It was 11 to one for that. It was 10 to one overall. So overall, it yeah. actually did better. Yep. on the zero. In all fairness, you know, one of the things is we look at the aircraft and how tremendous they are. 
but a lot of the uns unsung heroes was the training program that we had going versus what the Japanese and the Germans had. We were producing consistently well-trained, qualified pilots using a lot of the combat veterans coming back to, to share their experiences. The German and Japanese, you flew until you were wounded beyond ability to fly or dead. And so w I think we had that long-term vision that helped us win the war in addition to fantastic aircraft. Now, the air, airplane was designed to operate off the carrier, correct, from the That's start? Right, from, from the start. Why did the Marines end up with it first and they weren't flying off the carrier? The Marines will tell you because they were better pilots. <laughs> I'm not a Marine. I respect them. Uh, the reality is, as much as the engineering was genius on, on the landing gear, there right. was a, a rebound, if you will, uh, challenge with the, the landing gear itself. And so you could get some pretty substantial bounces. So... They learned, they, they improved the gear. Um, the British were f operating them off aircraft carriers, and I think there's some new information now saying that Americans were also operating them um, before than we think they were. But, but the common belief is that the Marines were operating off fixed land bases first. Mm -hmm. it is, it's a sweetheart. It's a big, heavy airplane, um, but it handles well, slow, uh, and low and dirty. Uh, it's the perfect sort of rough field aircraft. Speaking of weight, it, what would they what well, would they operate this thing in, in so, combat weight wise? Well it's about twelve thousand five hundred, but I was gonna go back to the landing characteristics on this. One of the unique characteristics about this is every once in a while, you know, in a crosswind or whatever, you might have one strut collapse before the other. So the airplane will sit a little crooked even though you're traveling straight ahead, and most pilots you want to compensate and turn the aircraft, but you can't. You have to just trust that the lock tail wheel is taking you straight down the runway. You might put a little bit of aileron in, and then eventually it'll collapse on you. But, you know, that if you try, sometimes if you try to overcorrect with this aircraft, it'll get away from you on takeoff or on landing. Well, now you compared the Zero to it. How about other like aircraft, like the 51 or... Or whatever. <laughs> so, so Charlie and I... Not, not against each other, but yeah. the flying characters. We, we, we fly most of our time as Corsair and Mustang. Um, so uh, we've, we've got a lot of time in both. But as far as characteristics, they both fly pretty similar, except the Corsair is heavier. And um, the Mustang is obviously faster. So when we're out flying, i got to ask them to slow down because I can't keep up with you. In, in the cockpit, I think the comparison is the Corsair is the muscle car of yes, the airplanes. Yes, that's a good the, comparison. The Mustang is very refined, the Cadillac. The only thing is when it's hot, like Mark was mentioning earlier, the Corsair, you can open the canopy. <laughs> <laughs> now, let's just jump over the 51 here for a little bit. How about the, the specifications on it? You want to, you, are you the expert? Who's the expert? No, I'm, on I'm not an expert he, in he's anything. He's the expert flying so. it. No, <laughs> few people fly it better. Uh, the amazing story, and again, this is the American ingenuity and, and the industry stepping up to you know, produce what we needed at the time. From the time that uh, North American had that contract in hand to a first flying prototype, was 102 days. You would never see that now. Airplanes are a little more complicated. But it was uh, the North, uh, North American team uh, went back, and even in Washington, the night that, that they had those specs in hands, they went in and came up with the preliminary design, and then 102 days later, they had a flying prototype. Now, the British got the airplane first, right, with the Allison That's engine? Correct. Yep. Well, tell and about the conversion for the Allison to the uh, The, the Allison uh, down low was fine, but in Europe, the battle and Pacific, the battles were up high. So you needed a good turbocharged uh, engine that operated 30,000, 40,000 feet. And it was the British who married the, uh, the Rolls-Royce Merlin engine with this airframe and produced probably one of the best aircraft uh, of the war, if, if not the best all-around combat you know, fighter. And then Packard, they started building the Merlin engines That's right. for hours. So it was licensed, built to, to Packard. So most, all of the engines that you see these days were actually American-built. Well, I, I think one of the remarkable things about this thing is what, what a kill ratio it had. And it, it didn't even enter the war until 1944. 
late 43 or 44. I, I think and that's the training, but, you know, as Mark knows from flying it so much, um, you take a lower time, and, and he trained me, so I blame yeah. him for my landings. Uh, <laughs> but, you know, you can take somebody who's a lower time pilot, and relative to these two guys, I'm a civilian trained low time guy who flies a desk for a living and not, not airliners. Um, it was a plane that with a few hundred hours in T6s, you could translate and i mean you see guys training in it all the time yeah i've, I've done about well i've done 22 uh checkouts for guys in the mustang and two of them are right here today <laughs> <laughs> but um yeah that it's it's one of those airplanes that if if you could fly the t6 well the transition to the mustang is truly just a transition i'm not actually teaching somebody to fly the airplane it's just coaching them is what i call it into the uh but in, in all fairness now these planes that we fly whether it's zach in the 86 or either of these planes they were designed for combat you know this wasn't for the sunday driver that you give mm. a whole lot of buffet in case somebody screw you know messes up you get to the point where you know, this plane uh, more so the mustang but you stall that thing, and it'll just bite you hard. So, yeah. uh, you know, that's where accidents happen. And we do hear with all that power with both airplanes, a lot of people say, well, gee, you know, you push that throttle forward, and doesn't it torque roll? If you're insane, yes, but, you know, nobody's trained to do that. I will tell you, my first flight in, in the Corsair was out of Mark's personal airport, beautiful grass strip in upstate New York that has a little bit of a hill that I call Mount Everest. He calls it a hill. And I've never really hesitated after good training to fly an airplane. You can't see anything over that nose. The airport sort of pinches in with big, tall trees on either side. And I hesitated. I said, what am I doing here? Yeah. And one of the few planes where he finally said, you know what, just push it forward and we'll make it happen. And that was yeah. my first Corsair flight. Well, what are you guys, Tim, give me the typical armament this would have in the uh, escort as an escort, because it's a different, it'd be completely right. different than air to ground work. It was uh, an effective air to ground, but it had the weakness of, of a you know uh, water cooled or a, a radiator. Radiator, and you know one lucky shot and your day is ruined. A plane like this, you could take out a cylinder, and there's all kinds of stories that they would still make it back to the carrier. A typical combat mission, and, and I'll tell you first now, Mark's you know only 25. I'm a little bit older than that. You sit in this plane. We were flying up here yesterday from down south, and after two hours, you were ready to jump out of the thing if we weren't landing soon. So these young guys who were flying five, six, seven hours to Berlin and back, just incredible. But a typical loadout was drop tanks to have the fuel to, to make it as far as you could, and then six 50 caliber machine guns that uh, just a tremendous uh, punch to yeah. it. Well, now they had completely different missions, but I'll put you on the spot. Which did you like best? <laughs> I, for me, it's the Mustang. I've got uh, 1,200 hours in a P-51. It's home for me. I, I, I just love flying it. it Most it, people that flew 51 will say that. It is. You know, I get to fly I, a lot I'll of different argue, ones. I, I love that Corsair. That he, Corsair he loves the Corsair. such a beast. You can open the canopy. Yeah. The only thing is I get older, climbing up and down in that cockpit and that dripping radial engine. And the Mustang, I'll grant it, is a little and, more And refined. we have both fallen off the wing before, yeah, which right. that, hey, hey, that, that's hey, you're a, not supposed to I know. It's how, a, how about the slippery. difference in the A, B, C, and D on the 51? Uh, so I've, had, I've flown um, the B and the C and the D. Um, I, I've not flown the A model, but, um, you know, it, pretty much the same um, stall characteristics are different on the, the B and the C. That's the, uh, you know, I, I've done some training in them, and I've had twice where the student actually pulled a little too hard on the top of a loop, and the airplane unhooked, and we did a half of a snap roll on the top of a loop, which that'll get your attention in any airplane, especially a P-51. And, and the earlier, the, the um, visibility. Talk yeah, about yeah the visibility was was not as good as it is with the bubble canopy. It had the, uh, the canopy with the side door that would latch, and one time we had that unlatch during flight which again that that kind of stuff gets your attention where the the new bubble canopy you just roll it forward and you know great visibility great flying airplane zach let's talk a little bit about this f-86 everybody's favorite airplane <laughs> Tell it us is what, my favorite airplane. well <laughs> it is a lot of people the 51 or the 86 but uh Tell us about this the airplane this little bit of specs on it how range on it thrust whatever well, the, the book says it'll go about 1,000 miles when it has the big drop tanks. We got the small drop tanks on here, the 120-gallon drop tanks. With the 200-gallon drop tanks, it's, it's supposed to go about 1,000 
we just got this out of restoration about 60 uh, restoration about 60 days ago so we're taking baby steps up to really find out what the uh, range of the aircraft would be we've flown it 400 450 at lower altitudes and are working our way up so armor has got uh, 650 cows which we right we've have restored obviously they're mock-up right. guns but uh, we actually got the feeds and all that stuff why not real stuff <laughs> eh, that atf you know well you in florida <laughs> So I understand there was 9,800 built. How many do you think are still flying about? I think the last time I looked, there was eight, and uh, about half those aren't uh, in a position to fly right now. So I think there's four in the United States that are four or five that are flyable today. Okay. Yeah. All right. How about it? Did it service mission well? The F-86, yes, it did a really good job. I mean, Korea is where it really uh, right. uh, showed itself. and. I want to talk a little bit about the paint job. And well, we get the, yeah. Oh, get there in a second? Yeah, right, that, 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 that's, that's number six. <laughs> oh, right, jumped ahead. Okay. All right. Well, tell us about the, it was called the last true dogfighter and what the kill ratio was. Yeah, the Korean War, I, I, I don't remember the kill ratio exactly. Ten to one. Ten to one, which is right up there with yeah. our other aircraft. Um, and the other question was? Was, well... Why was it called the last oh, dogfighter, true dogfighter? No missiles. It has uh, guns, so that's uh, why they call it the last, the last okay. gunfighter. All right, now let me talk about the paint job and who it's dedicated to. Okay, it's it's uh, as we talked about earlier with our foundation, we try to identify a person and in, in the uh, and the person that flew that aircraft, and then honor that person. George Davis is the uh, person you'll see his name on the left side of the airplane. He was a Medal of Honor winner and what's called an ace of aces. He was an ace in World War II in the P-51, and he was an ace in the Korean War. By the time that uh, he passed away, he had 21 kills or 21 victories total. And at that time when he passed away, he was the, um, he was one of the most famous aces of all of all time during the Korean War. And is actually, if you look up his history, it shows that uh, that the the uh, Russians, uh, Chinese, and the Koreans were actually gunning for him because of all the publicity he was getting. At that time, we generally, um, the rule was if you became an ace in the Korean War, you were immediately retired and sent back home because now you're a war hero. Well, they didn't want to bring him back because his, uh, his, his uh, style and his kill ratio was so high. The, the story that really uh, impressed us with George Davis was he was engaged in a fight with 15 MiG 15s um, over Korea. Um, he had he had he had got uh, two uh, bombers, one fighter, and he was returning to base. And one of his buddies was engaged with two MiGs on his tail and was getting shot up. He turned, re-engaged, shot one of the MiGs, disengaged the other while 24 MiGs were in pursuit, and he uh, made it back to base, landing landing on fumes. The uh, the Citation, the Silver Star citation from that reads uh, five gallons on board. And anyone's ever flown a uh, Sabre jet, you don't want to be at five gallons, trust me. Um, so we really uh, like that. So the day he uh, became of Ace of Aces, he was flying misbehaving. So this aircraft, I have to write it down because I can't memorize it. So 30, 34th Fighter Squadron, 4th Fighter Wing, and the 5th Air Force misbehaving. This was the, uh, we, we painted this aircraft in honor and matched his paint scheme on that day. So. Okay, let's talk a, bit, a little bit about the aces. That we, had, we had 40 aces in, the, in Vietnam, I mean in, in Korea, right. and 39 of them were in this airplane. Correct. A like airplane. Had one in the Corsair, and this is just a little bit of information. It was a Navy night fighter. His name was Guy de Bordelon, and he shot down five airplanes with that. Airplane, with that. Okay, thanks, guys. We're, we're going to have... A little question and answer here, just if I can get somebody with the mics out here. Uh, was the Sabre ever used as a ground pounder? You mean as air to ground? Yes, it could carry a thousand pound bombs on the outboard wing, up to thousand pound bombs, they would use it, but that was, it was mainly an air superiority type fighter. Well, nothing further. We want to thank you folks. Please show up again at uh, one o'clock. We're going to have a good show there. The, the show at 1 o'clock is about the Navy airplanes that were lost in Lake Michigan. And uh, the, the guy that recovered it is going to give us a little talk to us and tell us about it. 
So please show up. Thank you.